If I haven't had the privilege to meet you yet, my name is Joshua Kirstein. I'm the preaching pastor here at Disciples Church. It's a joy to have you with us if you're visiting in this uh, special new season of our historic church here in Bakersfield. If you don't know, Bakersfield is in its 129th year of ministry here in Bakersfield. We are the first Baptist church of Bakersfield, going back to the very roots and beginnings of the city in 1889. Um, we're joyful to be in this beautiful new campus and have an opportunity to be loving and connecting with families and individuals from around our community, people driving in from Shafter and from the east side and from Taft, and just a joy to see what God's doing in, in and through uh, the life of his people, his, his bride, the church. Um, we have a passion here for preaching God's word, it's authoritative word, it's a word that brings true and great life change. Um, if you have Bibles, I encourage you to bring them. You would open them together as we dive in this morning. You can open to the letter of James as we're in part 10 of our series in the letter of James. Uh, you'll find it the, towards the back of your Bible uh, after Hebrews and before 1 Peter. Uh, we're calling our series Faith at Work. And uh, today I get the privilege to preach verse 22 through 25. Our sermon bumper that plays before the sermon in the early parts of our series here uh, is the text that I will preach today that we've been um, digesting and contemplating for the last 10 weeks. And so we're finally there in the passage. I'm excited for today's word, a sermon that I've titled um, Doers of the Word. You'll see why in just a moment. Look with me at James chapter 1, verse 22 through 25. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only. Deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Much to do in this text, and so I want to dive right in this morning. I want to first start out by pointing out the necessity of what it is to hear before we do. Last week, we heard James emphasize, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear. James 1.19 The passage we will study today is going to emphasize that the truly saved in Jesus Christ don't just hear, but do what God commands of us. Before we get to the doing, I want to make sure that we understand while James says, don't be hearers only, he's not saying that hearing is of no good. No, hearing is essential. He's simply saying true believers don't just hear, but they act, they respond, they obey. So what is it about our hearing that is important for us to recognize today before we focus on the doing most essentially, we have no faith in God, no life in Christ, without first hearing. God's word is clear in Romans 10, 14. How are they to believe in him whom they have never heard? Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing, that is hearing the good news about Christ. There are many people Many people who hear with their physical ears the gospel of Jesus, but they do not believe. Hebrews 4.2 For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them, because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For those who heard the same gospel was preached to this crowd, to these people. Some were given by God's sovereign rule, ears to hear it, and others were not. 
in their sin, in their slavery to sin, as the scripture speaks of it, they did not hear the good news and then therefore repent and believe. They heard it with their physical ears, but not with spiritual ears. This points out the essential sovereign work of God to unstop the spiritually deaf ears so that when we hear the good news preached or testified of, our response is repentance and belief. Jesus told a parable in Mark 4 about different kinds of soil representing different kinds of hearing of the gospel. His point was to clarify the need to truly hear the gospel. You must be given ears to hear it. Saying most poignantly in Mark 4, 9, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. This is the sovereign work of God to open spiritually deaf ears, to hear the good news of Jesus so that we truly repent from sin and trust alone in Him for salvation. John 3, 6, That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. The Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, plays a vital role in God's elect being born again. Spiritual new birth is an essential step for anyone who is dead in sin to be made alive by the Spirit. For only then, only when they're made alive by the Spirit, can they hear the gospel and respond with saving faith. Church, I want you to be oh so mindful and thankful for the work of the Holy Spirit, whom without we would be spiritually dead and deaf. We are desperate for the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. To do without true regeneration and Holy Spirit conviction is self-righteous earning. It is religion at its best to come and hear the Word of God taught with no true spiritual life, with no new birth in Christ, and then to hear the commands of God and go try to live them out, to do them without first being reborn, is religion. It's, it's earning. This is a doing that efforts to earn God's favor. It is weighty. It is impossible. <laughs> and so maybe you grew up with religion. Maybe you grew up with what felt like simply a list, a list of rules, a, a weight of expectation. There was no life to it. There was no joy in your obedience. This is simply a sign of still being spiritually dead. That, that you must be reborn. The Holy Spirit must give you ears to hear, to see and savor the gospel, that in now the power of God, it is your joy to obey and follow him. By God's grace and doing, we hear the word of God and then respond with the Holy Spirit conviction then now our doing is God-powered, God-motivated. This is the critical first step in our faith at work. It is our doing the commands of God. It is our being faithful to Him. If not powered by the Holy Spirit, first in hearing, then all of the doing is vain. It is religion, and it is good for nothing. So make it personal today. Are you just doing what you think you're supposed to because you think it's right? Or are you doing the things of God because you are convicted in your hearing of His Word that it is His perfect will and way for you? 
One of these is religion leading to death. One of these is gospel freedom unto eternal life with God forever. Oh, how I pray that we do not miss the vital role of Holy Spirit-empowered hearing. And now with that underneath us, let's dive into the meat of James' point here in verse 22. But be doers of the word, not hearers only deceiving yourselves. James says that one of the great signs of, of true faith in God, faith that remains at work, is faith that is lived out in obedience to his word. That we do not just hear it, but we do it. Let me state right now out front how how vital this is to our faith. Because we are not trusting God if we do not obey God. How can you say, I trust God? I have faith in God, but I don't obey Him. The byproduct of true love for God is true devotion to Him. And this is the way it is with anything. And if not, then it is hypocrisy. If you say you love your spouse, but then live in a constant state of unfaithfulness to your marriage vows, you don't really love your spouse. You might think you have an idea of that, but it is not love to continue to be unfaithful to your spouse. If you say you love your job, but you hardly ever show up to work. Or you put in no real effort, then where is the evidence that you love your job? There's an idea maybe in your head that you love your job, but do you really? Proven by what you do? It is simply not true love or devotion if it's not backed up with action, with doing. The Apostle Paul is going to emphasize this same thing in Romans 2.13. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. You cannot claim to know and love Jesus and disregard the fact that He is God. Which means... If you know that he is God, you will love him. You will submit to him. Because he is God, those who belong to him will embrace his authority as God. This means you will love to be ruled by him. Do you love to be ruled by God? To be commanded? Is he your master? your Lord. For those of you truly still in the flesh, not saved and set free by the gospel, that that won't seem like a good thing to you. But when new birth has happened, when you see your sin and your desperation for Christ alone, and you trust Him with your life, there is no greater joy than for Jesus to be your Lord and Master to submit your life to him. This means when we're ruled by him, we are no longer ruled by this world, by our flesh, by our family heritage, by your personal preferences. This means... Elder Rob prayed earlier, we don't endorse abortion because, it, because our culture has found a way to call it good and to declare it legal. Or your own logic seems to say that a woman's right to choose is greater than the right of the child in the womb to live. No, we fight our flesh We push back against our culture's agenda and we obey God's word.
This means we don't endorse homosexuality because our culture has found a way to call it good and right. And because maybe your son or daughter feels that they might be homosexual. No. We fight our flesh to call what God calls sin good. And instead we obey His holy word. And we walk in the love of God. We, we, we speak the gospel truths to those who might struggle with these fleshly tendencies. But we do not throw our arm around it and call it good and say it's okay. If you feel like I'm picking on a certain kind of sexuality, let me be general. We don't sleep with or cohabitate with someone who's not our spouse. Because our culture has found a way to call it good and to say that it's normal. Maybe it's easier on your finances. Or maybe because you just really declare boldly that you love each other. No, no, we fight our flesh to call what God calls sin good. And instead, we obey God's holy word. And we find a way to honor God in our relationships. No matter what the cost, our highest priority is to honor our Lord, our God. To love Jesus is to love his rule and authority in your life. Which means you will keep his commands. You will be doers of his word and not hearers only. Percy W. Hayward is a Bible scholar in the late 1800s and early 1900s, a Christian contemporary of A.W. Pink and R.C. Ryle, J.C. Ryle. Uh, he spoke to this very well in simply saying, all sentimental talking and singing about love are vain, unless by grace we show a truthful obedience. There is more hypocrisy than we suppose. Love is practical, or it's not love at all. Look with me at John's first letter in chapter 5, 1 John 5, 2 through 3. By this, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. His commandments are not burdensome. Christian, you cannot proclaim Jesus as Lord of your life and then despise His commands. His commands are not burdensome to a true believer. And you don't obey them begrudgingly either. For those who are truly saved, it is our joy to submit to his holy, revealed will. It is not a burden. Do you know when the commands of the Lord become burdensome in our lives? And we've all been in that place. We've allowed our flesh to take us to that place. It is when we are truly more interested in serving our will than God's will. When we in sin set him aside and don't see him with the awe the gospel and new life in Christ has provided us. When we get our affections and our priorities focused on ourselves is when we despise his commands and consider them burdensome. Christian, check yourself. When in your flesh you would declare that a command of God in any way is not perfect or good because of your fleshly perspective on that area of life. We need to repent of this attitude. We need to mature away from this thinking. Now, a true Christian may backslide for a moment or even a short season, but in the end, 
a true Christian will joyfully submit to God. Why? Because his or her heart has been changed. The good tree cannot produce a lasting crop of bad fruit. If it does, it proves to not be a good tree, a redeemed tree. An unconverted tree may say they love Jesus, but their fruit and their lack of faithfulness and lasting obedience says otherwise. Church, this is not a one-time emphasis of Jesus and the apostles. In their writings again and again, we see these things. John, in his first letter, chapter 2, 4 and 5, whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commands, is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of the Lord is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. This is what our faith at work looks like, church. Enduring obedience and doing of the word. In John chapter 14, verse 21, Jesus says very clearly, Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. The evidence of a true believer who loves Jesus as Lord of their life is one who has and keeps the commands of God. A.W. Pink says, How this verse rebukes the increasing antinomianism of our day. In some circles, one cannot use the word commandments without being frowned upon as a legalist. Multitudes are now being taught that law is an enemy of grace and that the God of Sinai is a stern and forbidding deity laying upon his creatures a yoke of grievousness to be born. Terrible travesty of the truth is this. The one who wrote upon the tablets of stone is none other than the one who died on Calvary's cross. And he who here says, If ye love me, keep my commandments, also said at Sinai, He would show mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. A.W. Pink wrote this over a hundred years ago, and yet it describes our modern day culture to a T. It shows how potent sin is among people who profess Christ. Sin in mankind that gives us the audacity to want to rewrite what God has made clear. Wants to repackage and reprioritize what God has made clear. What has been the standing truths of our Christian faith for thousands of years. Yeah, can you go find places and churches that will call these things that God calls sin okay? They're out there. They're rewriting the Holy Word of God. They're known as revisionists. They're liars and deceivers and are not pointing to the true gospel or the living God. We are saved by grace alone, not by our works of any kind, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Not if any of our obedient works or will earn salvation. Hear that clearly today. It's this why we sing the gospel of grace that we did nothing. I, everything I did worked against salvation. It is Christ alone who I desperate for. But to declare that that's where you're at and then to stop is to miss the, all the teachings of Scripture that call us to a life of obedience, of, of the new life He's saved us to. We 
we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. This is true. But it does not mean the moral, the universal commandments of God and the new covenant positive law commands of God are not for us to obey once we are saved. The good news is that we now have the power and the desire to obey the good and right commandments of God. In Christ alone this is possible and it is the evidence of our salvation. A.W. Pink mentions in this quote I read a moment ago a big, a big word, antinomianism. Let me break that one down. It's two Greek words together, anti meaning against, nomos meaning law. Antinomianism means against the law. Theologically, antinomianism is a heretical belief that God does not have standing commands on his people, on his creation, that we are to obey. It's people who grab hold of grace and then just stay right there with grace for all of life, thereby throwing out much of the scriptures. We laughed how the, preaching this text, I could take probably eight weeks to do it, just to show you all that the scriptures say about this topic. By good discipline and good focus this morning, we'll do it in one. So it's your job to listen real carefully. Some people think wrongly. They think, if I'm saved by grace and all my sins are forgiven, why is there any concern for whether or not I sin now or follow God's commands? It's all covered, right? And that thinking is not the proper response, the biblical response, to true conversion, to true salvation. Because true conversion produces a genuine and ever-increasing desire to honor God and obey His commandments. It is the Spirit of God in us now that brings about conviction and a true desire to submit to God and no longer our flesh. And so I just simply pause to ask you, what are things in your faith walk that you just you do them because it just works for you? You kind of know in the back of your head, no, the Word speaks to these things, things that God's called me to do, but I've, I've found my way with Him. I, I feel good about where I'm at. Repent of that. Ongoingly. Delve into God's Word. Dive deeply into gospel community. That you would invite people to love you enough to help you see and savor God's call on your life in even all the little areas. That in no way are you Lord of your own life anymore. So what does that look like in the area of relationship? Or parenting? Or money management? Or commitment to church, family, and shepherds? to discipleship. And, and what you do with your free time and what you call good that God calls sin and, and on and on. I, my great hope is that in any conviction the Holy Spirit puts on you today that you look forward with an attitude of repentance. That we don't not change because we're embarrassed about the past. The greatest way you honor God and join what He's called you to do is to change, is to repent and start fresh today. That's the focus. That's the priority. To be willing to call what was in the past sin. To not let it define you. But to be who you are in Christ moving forward in your obedience. There's a nuance I want to merely make sure you get. The result of regeneration, of new birth in our lives, means the sovereign God gives us a new heart, new desires, that the tree of our life will go on to produce good and an ongoing crop of God-honoring fruit. Again, that doesn't mean that the true Christian doesn't have days or seasons of struggle with sin. A true Christian will struggle will sin 
can even do grievous sin. A true Christian can languish in immaturity. But the difference between a true Christian and not a true Christian is the true Christian will not stay there. You will repent, you will grow, you will mature. Your faith will finish the race. There must be real repentance. To not produce an ongoing yield of dishonoring fruit. No matter how much it interrupts your life, your family, your home, your current lifestyle, it is your joy to honor God in these things and not to serve your own flesh. The real struggle in backsliding that many face is when we reject Christian discipline. That God's instructed us to be part of. To blatantly deny the authority of God's word and to go our own way unrepentantly. To not be in step with the gospel. To not be aligned with Christ. So, so God even goes so far to instruct us to disfellowship with people who refuse to practice repentance. People who claim Christ but refuse to practice repentance because it, it sends a false testimony of the gospel. It is a loud testimony of hypocrisy. If they are truly saved and converted by the Spirit, they will come to repent and obey God with their life. If not, they prove to never have been one of us. That's what the Scriptures teach. So how antinomianism plays out in our modern culture is some one who is known as a professing Christian is seen or caught in sin, and another faithful Christian lovingly and faithfully calls them out to repent, to turn to God, to obey God and His commandments. But another person might observe this and say, whoa, 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 who are you to say that? Where is your grace? Or they'll say, you have no place to judge them. These are, these are anti-biblical, antinomianism ways of looking at Christianity. Church, all of this is rooted in a, a misapplied, fleshly process of thought that has infected the modern church. Yes, we are saved by grace, but the evidence of salvation, it is a desire and a doing of the will of God. Amen? This, this is clearly Jesus' teaching, John 14, 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And James, in, in our verse today, be doers of the word, not hearers, only deceiving yourselves. One of the best signs of true saving faith and not superficial faith, faith that doesn't save, is obedience to God's word. James says we must be doers of the word because it is those who joyfully obey God's word that prove to belong to God and trust Jesus as Lord. John makes this emphasis in 1 John 2, 3 through 6. By this we know we've come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says I know him but does not keep the commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Whoever keeps his word in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we know we're in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way with which he walked. A fuller exposition of text I read earlier. But, but here are the clarity. Do we see the evidence of, of true faith at work that James is giving here? Be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Our faith at work means we will be doers of the word and not hearers only. It's just that simple. May it be so in our lives, in our church. And if today you, you're seeing areas where you've not been doing that, the beautiful call of God, the doable call of God is for you to confess it as sin and turn from it and begin a new course that honors Him. 
to not go at that alone, but to do it with the church, with people who love you, can walk with you to fight that and to grow and mature in Christ. To walk with you to have tough conversations or to make changes in your life that are substantial, whatever it takes to honor him, to be doers and not hearers only. thereby deceiving ourselves. Which leads us to the next point. Look at verse 20, the end of 22. Thereby deceiving yourselves, for anyone who is a hearer of the word and not a doer is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away at once, forgets what he was like. The deception that we fall into is that we hear God's word, we understand it, we even might say we agree with it. Might even go so far to post it on Facebook or put it on a bumper sticker. But then don't do it. That's deception. Deception is living in a false state. To hear God's commands and truth, but to not be changed by them. To, To not obey them is a false state. Deception is to hear the holy and perfect word of God and then to think that you have a better way it should be played out. It is deception to just attend church, to hear God's word, even to say you understand, but then not go act on it. Obey it and testify to it in your daily life. And yet for many, for many, 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 this is what the Christian life is. Hundreds of thousands of self-professing Christians gather around the world every Sunday to listen. But they do very little, if anything, to do what they've heard God speak of in His Word. This is the state of religion. This is not gospel transformation. This is purely religion. People who think that they're good with God because they're going through some religious activity, but at the end of the day, there's no true heartfelt conviction to turn from sin or devotion to live for God with all their lives. Their personal preferences, priorities, or convictions are more important to them than the Holy Word of God, than the glory and the name of God and His truth and His love. Who is life? True faith in Jesus is a faith at work. This is James' primary emphasis in this letter with the most practical applications, which is why it's been so sweet to be 10 weeks into this already and just have so much good application. You are deceived if you claim faith in Christ, but that faith is not at work. Faith that is not doing This is where James will go in the most famous instruction of this letter that we'll see in chapter 2, verse 17. Faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. It is deception to think that you belong to God, that Jesus is Lord, but then not to obey God and follow God his instruction as Lord of your life. Just hear the hypocrisy and the controversy of that very term. Jesus is Lord, and yet I do not follow him. I do not obey him. It's not my joy to submit to him. Do you see? Jesus is not Lord in that situation because you still are. This is Satan's greatest victory. In all the ways that he's defeated, this deception is the greatest reality for Satan in the modern era. That people attend church, enjoy sermons, even think that they're good with God, and yet they do not repent. They do not trust God. They do not obey God. They do not mature in Christ. They are close to the truth. They even dance with the truth. But they're not changed by it. They're not made new by it. This is deception at its best. 
And and here's the sobering truth. To those to whom this description applies, you do not belong to God. You still belong to Satan, the father of lies, the doctor of deception. And so stop. Stop not loving your family because you are perpetuating the lie that because a family member said a prayer many years ago or attended a church for a season, but there's no real evidence of fruit, stop declaring over them that they're saved. Have genuine concern for them that according to the word of God, that true salvation by grace alone and faith in God produces a life of obedience and honoring God. Now, at the end of the day, you don't know, but you do know what you see, and you do know what the Word teaches, so don't create an economy of your own because it's sweet little cousin Timmy and just declare that he's good. That's not loving him. Do you see that? I I pray you see that. I I, I pray you're, you're moved by that. Because it's God's word poured over the reality of loved ones that we hold dear. And if you're broken by that, if you're, if you're concerned for that, then that's all the more reason why you in your life need to take more seriously the things of God in your days, in your hours, the life of the church, the, li- the process of disciple-making and sanctification. That the gospel would be on display in the sweetest ways for those that we love. The fact that this reality of claiming faith but not showing any fruit of it is so rampant in the church is why the church is so commonly called hypocritical. Because so many say they belong to Christ and yet they live like they belong to the devil. They say amen to the truths of God. They post them all over their page. but it's not their reality in how they live their life. There's an old Scottish term for those who would enjoy sermons without real repentance and action. They called them sermon tasters. They would taste and even go so far to say, mmm, yummy. But they would not eat. They would not live it out Let the power of God change them to a life that honors him. If anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he's like. The illustration used here gives us a way to consider the depth of James' warning. To look in the mirror and see yourself as you really are is to be biblically informed about who you are in your sin and or who you are in Christ. This is to see who you are in your sin, who God is and what he has done or is doing through Christ to make us new. But then to walk away and go live your life as if you never were exposed to these realities. This comes back to the vital role of the Holy Spirit to bring us forth. As we saw just a few verses ago, a few weeks ago, verse 18 to give us new birth, to give us ears to hear and eyes to see. For the unregenerate person will hear the truths of God with their ears, see the life-changing gospel and people around them, but they will be unaffected by it. They will go about their lives like they never heard it or witnessed it. And nothing changes. The bigger concern is for the person who claims to be saved having been given eyes to see and ears to hear, but then you walk as if you're unaffected by it. This is true deception, highlighting superficial faith. Those with superficial faith hear truth, might even say amen to truth, but then you walk out the door and eat a cheeseburger at lunch and forget what you just heard. This is deception. You've already moved on. You've forgotten. 
To hear and forget is to listen superficially. It is to not listen at all. If you're a parent, you know what this is like. Do you understand what you're supposed to do? Yes, I understand what I'm supposed to do. Tell me what you're supposed to do. I'm supposed to do this. Kid walks away, doesn't do any of it. (laughs) Did they really listen? No. No. They mechanically recited words coming out of your mouth, and it went like this. It does no good for the information of God's word to pass through with no action. You must receive it and then joyfully act on it. Joyfully, not begrudgingly, joyfully. It must move from from here or, or even here, the mind, to here, the heart, to here, the hands. And the mouth. Or what good is it? You want to know how you're doing in your faith walk? According to James, according to the apostles of the New Testament? How how are you being sanctified? Where, Where are you changing? Where are you growing? It is not a good sign if this year looks a lot like last year. Or the year before that. That we're, that we're maturing. That we're making war with our flesh. That we're not finding routines and staying there. Look at James 1.25. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Perfect law. Quickly, I want to just review the crescendo that this verse is to this text. Why is the law of God perfect? Because God is perfect. Amen? God's ways are better than our ways. He's, and it's so much bigger than that. God's ways are better than our ways. No, no, no. God's ways are perfect. Really chew on that. That's how messed up it is when I make war with any of God's ways. He's not just better. They're perfect. Psalm 19.7, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. This is not speaking of the law of Moses of the Old Testament. It's speaking of the law of God, the perfect and authoritative ways of God to follow Jesus himself said in Matthew 5, 17 through 20, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota or not a dot will pass from the law until it is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them to be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is serious about us obeying his holy word. Look at the next part. But the one who looks in the perfect law, the law of liberty. What is the law of liberty? It's the gospel. The gospel that sets us free and brings obedience in our lives. We're no longer slaves to sin. We're slaves to Christ, slaves to righteousness. Praise God for freedom from slavery to sin so that we can be slaves of Christ, obey Christ, follow Christ, the one true God, to serve his mighty name instead of ourselves. If you abide in my word, Jesus says, you are truly my disciples. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. If you are here today, And you are yet to truly trust in Jesus alone for salvation. Nothing you can do can earn your way 
to fellowship with a holy God. You need a holy representative to pay for all of your sin. There is no way to God but through Christ that you would repent of your sin and trust in Jesus with all of your life and be saved. This is my prayer for you. And finally, the one who looks in the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. James is back to his mega theme of perseverance, of steadfastness, of faith that remains at work. See and savor this with me. It keeps trucking. It might get knocked down, but it gets up in repentance and continues down the road. Why does the one who does God's word and not only hear it, hears it, why does that one persevere? Because God's true sheep, hear this, do not only hear his voice, they follow and obey their shepherd. John 10, 27-29, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. This is perseverance. The one who perseveres, who is steadfast, whose faith remains at work, proves to be those who are blessed. Blessed to be part of the eternal flock. Only in Christ are we truly blessed. We are blessed because we are a part of those who now live for and honor God. Amen? Jesus said, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Blessed are those. A sign that you're truly blessed is not only that you hear it, but you keep it. Joshua 1.8, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to that which is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, then you will have good success. Psalm 13, 13, whoever despises the word brings destruction on himself. Whoever reveres the commandment will be rewarded. See the blessing of God wrapped up in the work of Christ for his redeemed. And the evidence that you're a part of that blessing is in your faith at work lived out, is in your obedience that you are a doer and not a hearer only. Amen? Pray with me. Father, we thank you for this day that you have made an opportunity to delve into a very critical, important, and essential text in this letter of James. An opportunity for us to, to see and savor these truths according not just to one verse, but, but all of Scripture. That you have set us free from a, a spirit that was only into sin to now a spirit that wants to honor you as God and obey you and bring glory to your name, reverence. And so I pray, Lord, that in all the different ways you've brought conviction on the hearers today, that that is a good gift, that we would not remain where we are, but we would do business with this, that we'd not be people who forget after lunch, but we would delve back in this afternoon. We would be feasting on your word throughout this week equipping ourselves with the truths of God that we'd be convicted by the Holy Spirit to act, to live, to make the most of these days that you've entrusted to us for your glory Lord I'm sorry if we've been too distracted in building our own households and kingdoms and generations and that the center of that has not been the glory of the Lord Father Use this as a tool to take us forth in maturity and in growth, to bring in other believers around us to, to be accountable to and, to and to ask for their help in maturing in these ways. We love you. And it's the name of Jesus that we want to sing high and sing loud to the watching world. So hear us now as we proclaim your name 
as we prepare to leave this place today. In Jesus' name, amen.